Hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy and More. And today I'm excited to have uh, my guest, Brian Kasten with me. Welcome, Brian. Oh, thanks for having me, John. My pleasure. Yeah. This is going to be fun. Uh, you know, you have a different um, approach to music and art uh, than anyone I've anyone I know really but uh, anyone that I've had in the podcast before so I'm you know looking forward to see where this journey takes us so am I so um so Brian uh, I'll just you know give a brief uh, introduction to how we've come to meet each other uh from my memory and then I'm curious to hear what you say uh I remember that you and I met in Brooklyn College I'm gonna guess somewhere in 98, 99, um, if you were there at that time, because that's when I entered. And I know you were in the earlier part of my uh, time there. And you were this funky dude who like really had a vision about playing guitar. And I guess I gathered that you were improvisator, improv type of guy. I wasn't sure what you were into. I knew you were somewhat affiliated with Lars and the guitar ensemble, but not quite really, you know, so, but uh, yeah. And then I guess we had a chance to play together at some point I, on what, I don't know, but um, it was, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it was, you know, kind of ships crossing in the night a little bit, but we got a chance to know each other. And then, you know, and then through your wife later on, we got a chance, cause I met her and then we got a chance to hang out more. Um, so I'm curious, uh, what you remember about, uh, meeting, meeting me, if anything. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're correct. It was around 1998, 99. And, um, I remember, and it's funny cause we haven't spoken in a long time before we reconnected to do the podcast. And I remember your pieces of music, you know, that were written for the seasons that were really beautiful. I remember going to the recital and, and really digging them. You know, I remember, if I remember, it starts correct, it's 20 something years ago. We were like finger picking a tune called Autumn or something mm -hmm. going on for a bit and it was really nice. So, so yeah, no, I remember that. And I remember having fun playing in the ensemble. I think I was in grad school. I, I was in grad school, but you, were you doing undergrad at the time there? Yeah. And they kind of clumped us together. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was a fun time of hanging, you know, and playing and, I came out of a jazz performance program from SUNY New Paul's. So um, it was kind of cool to hang out with classical guys. Uh, I was actually a music ed major at Brooklyn College for grad school. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was in half ed classes and then the music was mostly classical there. So the hang out and, and check out the classical repertoire that you guys were studying was, was interesting. And to study the form of the music was really cool and to learn how to develop better finger picking as well. You know, studying mm -hmm. with Lars Franson was great. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, interestingly, I, I, I uh, interacted a lot with Lars and I was his student in the guitar ensemble and he, he helped me a great deal with getting my composition in front of people. But I never had, to, had the chance to uh, study with him with privately, interestingly. But uh, yeah, everyone, you know, uh, raves about taking lessons with him. And, you know, I've got a lot of indirect lessons from him. Um, but I, I did have a, a guitar, classical guitar teacher there for a year before uh, before that guy left. Um, anyway, uh, so Brian, I, I like my tr interview style is a little in untraditional. So I just like to, instead of saying what you do now, I like to kind of start from your beginning and then kind of will surprise sure. people by the time we end up wherever we end up. So can you remember what it was that got you into enjoying music in the first place? Yeah, and it's still the same thing now. It's just a frame of mind and the ability to focus and be immersed in the music. Um, I'm big into meditation. I'm big into visualization. Um, I'm big into uh, just bringing your mind to a place of um, just folk, not to sound cheesy about it, but a beautiful state of mind of just playing the music and just being immersed in the music or the art. I, I was always intrigued by watching players be in that state of mind. You know, like when they close their eyes and they're just going for it, they're not looking at their instrument and they're just zoning and playing. I was always intrigued by that. I'm still mm -hmm. intrigued by that. 
I'm still mm-hmm. trying to do it now. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it, it sometimes I'm I close my eyes and play, and sometimes I just stare into space and play. But I'm in the same zone of um, it's really like uh, a, a, a trance state. You know, mm-hmm. it's really a form of I'm actually a, a clinical um, hypnotist as well. Um, so I think in in those terms, in the sense of from a technical perspective, but you're really in a light trance state when you're improvising or playing, and you're just immersed in the music. You know, so it's a mixture between your conscious state and your subconscious state. So your conscious state, right, is what we're what we're feeling now, what we're thinking now, our analytical part of your mind. Like, you know, you're where you're if you're performing, you're where you're on stage or with other players and that and your subconscious is, you know, from a musical perspective, all the things that you practice before and all the things that you know. And it's a mixture and culmination of both. So for me, um, that's what it's about of, of being in that zone of really being in a trance state of creativity and flow you know like I really um when I was studying jazz and you know hanging out with people listening to jazz and you know listening to cats like John Coltrane and Meditations Out and and they would talk about um or just you know you read about or watch videos about they would talk about um now whether you believe in God or not is irrelevant I think for well for this part of the conversation but for me but they would talk about how the energy of God or professors are we talk about the energy of God coming through like Coltrane, like on a spiritual plane of just coming through him to play. Um, mm-hmm. So for me, whether it's, it's not so much, a, I'm not so religious, but, um, but in a spiritual sense, I try and get to that point of like um, everything else doesn't exist except where I am right now. And that's when the improvise probably improvising is, is, is feeling good for me. Um, mm-hmm. So it's about an energy source, but to get to that energy source to tap in, it's a mixture of being in that kind of like trancey state. And when I say that from an analytical perspective, you know, um, you know, that feeling how, uh, when you're like, say, for example, you're watching television and mm-hmm. you're just like, or a movie and we all know that TV and movie is fake. Right. But we let ourselves have the feeling of TV or movie. That's mm-hmm. what we watch because you want to zone out. So it's kind of like that, but from the perspective of creating the music and the sounds, um, as opposed to just watching it, where you're just totally immersed in it. So, but the reason I give that example, because um, they've studied the uh, neurofeedback, you know, as a form of hypnosis, where they studied the electronic signals in people's brains, where they, they put these, um, I forget the technical name of it, but they hook them up with all these electronic devices on their head. Um, I've had it done on me and I'm actually a good client because I'm bald as I think stick right on my head <laughs> <laughs> and they measure your your um, electrical pulses in your brain anyway when you're between like I believe it's six and seven cycles per second then you're in that trance state so you know the musicians that are improvising that have done it for a long time that can get into that trance state um, is actually a form of, of, of hypnosis which is cool so whether it's um you know, standing on a stage or in your room or whatever, that's where I like to be. I mean, that's the analytical psychology breakdown of what I try to to do. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but... <laughs> uh, no, actually it doesn't, uh, but it's all great information. My question is like, I'm more interested in like, what are you, some of your earliest inspirations? You know, when, did you listen to the Beatles when you were seven? And like, because, you know, what you're talking about sounds a little sophisticated to me it must have started maybe i'm wrong but it must have started like pretty simple like oh i heard this tune on the radio or maybe yeah. it was like a soundtrack or something i don't know i remember like i grew up with my friends in middle school i remember my first band that i got into was motley crew All right. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. the product of the 80s man i remember the exact moment of being in my friend's room and he's like he busts out this motley crew album and he's like yo man check this out and, uh, you know, I was a metalhead, man, I had the mullet and stuff. <laughs> uh, and I remember just being like, yeah, they're them cranking it up. And it was awesome. <laughs> and so, you know, all through high school, middle school, and high school, I was into metal. I was into funk. Um, I was into um, anything that sounded really good at the time. But it had, most of it was, you know, heavy groove music, things like that. And then actually... My couple, maybe like junior or high school or early, I started getting into jazz and blues and I started just, you know, I wanted something different. 
than just a steady rock thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I started getting into that and, you know, it blew my mind. Um, it blew my mind as like, how do they do that? Um, I like to understand how things work. So I was interested in it. So I wanted to study it because I wanted to, I wanted to be uh, one of those guys who could just play whatever you felt. And that, mm -hmm. that's my ultimate goal musically. I'm so, you know, right before this interview, I was practicing. Mm -hmm. I got a gig coming up at Pete's. I just played a gig the other night playing bass at Pete's Candy Store in Brooklyn. I'm playing again on the 25th of, uh, of April and I'm playing guitar and I'm trying to think, okay, well, you know, what kind of technique can I practice? Wow. So when I get to the stage, I can bring um, some new flavors there. But yeah, Sony, you know, so I started off with metal, got into blues, rock, funk, classic rock, you know, like Yes, Queen, Rush. And then as time got on, it was like 16, 17, I started getting more into the jazz thing. I love the swing feel, that laid back feel, of like be, being behind the beat and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and then, you know, by the time I, I didn't really, I didn't start playing guitar until I was 16 years old. Okay. So I always thought it would be cool to go like a, to a music school and study, and, but I wasn't really just good enough to get in. I couldn't sight read. I was barely starting at 16. I was working all the time. And so, um, I ended up just, you know, playing on the side. It was like a hobby or whatever. And then I went up to SUNY New Paltz um, and I was studying psychology up there and they also had a jazz program. So I started taking some electives. I, I really loved playing jazz or trying to play jazz or listening to jazz. I listened to cats like, um, you know, I got into like West Montgomery, Kenny Burrell, you know, Charlie Christian, you know, as far as guitar mm -hmm. players, um, um, George Benson, you know, all those great, great cast and then you know Schofield then I got into like Schofield Pat Metheny um, Mike mm -hmm. Stern and those guys and I was really attracted to um, like the Schofield like the, the dirtier rockier sound with the blues because he would bend the strings and things like that Mike Stern would bend the strings so I you know I started pretty traditional actually and then went into the more of the modern jazz guys you know and then from the modern jazz guys I kind of wanted more and different vibe then I started getting into the freer jazz so that was pretty much my my progression of what I was doing. So I was at college. Um, I was taking some jazz electives, um, some jazz improvisational courses, and then um, and then yeah, I just I was just hooked, man. I was just hooked, and I was just cranking forward and trying to That's practice as much as I can. So when I was one, I'm sorry. What, what was that? No, no, it's very interesting to me. I never really met or spoken to someone who like really got into jazz at a kind of young age. Um, I'm sure that there, there are probably lots like I met maybe, but never really. Yeah. Uh, I don't, yeah. Uh, <laughs> not, that's not too common. Yeah. I just, you know, the whole improv thing for me was, was what I was, what I was into, man. I just, I just, I love to improvise. Um, you know, I love to just make up stuff for anything. It's, mm -hmm a large part of my personality is I like to create something from nothing mm -hmm. and jazz improvisation is like the perfect thing for that type of um, person you know something from nothing you know mm -hmm. I actually have an album I have an album I, I want to release soon and I'm thinking of a title so I think I might even call that something from nothing because you know you just get into a room with a bunch of guys or girls or whoever and you just play and it's something from nothing and you know, we don't mm -hmm. have, we don't have tunes till after they're recorded. <laughs> right. have tunes, so it's kind of fun to see what the journey is going to be. Yeah. Um, I, I will get to your music a little more as we go on, but uh, I listened to some of your, you know, your, your, your albums uh, in preparing the questions and stuff. And i um, just let it play in the background. And, you know, I'm sure, I know, I'm sure, you know, free jazz is not for everybody, but uh, right. You know, it, it, after a while I started to hear it as uh, yeah, I mean to call it a tune you know is questionable depending on the tune maybe there is a tune and some, sometimes it's more of an atmospheric experience but it's cool it, it's not it's definitely not noise because uh, these are musicians that are expressing it's like uh, pure expression kind of that's how I, I experienced it you know yeah what albums did you listen to uh 
I did maybe the newest one. Um, not so standard. Is that the newest? Oh, right. Yeah, that's from a while back. To, to, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that actually had, I heard like higher ground and stuff. Uh, but then also, uh, I did really like the, um, I think it was called Appalachian Trail. Right. Yeah. I like that a lot. That's, yeah, I was actually playing that for someone today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was a fun project. That was with Mike Pride, great drummer, and Ryan Berger, upright player. And I was playing fretless on that. Um, so I still have this gallery in Greenwood Lake, New York. It's an art gallery and a jazz performance space or a music performance space. So every week I would just have players come in and improvise with me, um, like on a Friday, Saturday night or something. And then, you know, once the vibe was kind of cool, like the, the, all the players that came down were really talented and great, but I would have to find like, what was the most unique thing about this group or groups of people that I can pair up? So mm -hmm. I had a cool opportunity to, you know, play with them in jazz settings. And it's, if people check out my website or my YouTube channel, Brian Caston, um, you can, um, most of the videos are up there from the gigs. And then, you know, so for example, with that band where we played Appalachian Trail, the album called Trails, I played guitar in a trio and I liked it, but I was like, you know, I think the band would sound better if I played fretless bass against acoustic. I think it was just a cool way to do it uh, and to record it. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we did that. We went in, we did a double, I think that was a double album. Yeah, a double album, I think so. A double album one day, a lot of them are double albums. You just come in like around 12 o'clock and we just improvise. You know, we do a play for like an hour and a half, get some lunch or something, come back, hit it again and keep it. And that was <laughs> it. And, but I really loved like the acoustic sound. Ryan Berg was playing on the bass. He was using the bow, which mm -hmm. was super cool. And the fretless has a nice fat sound. And my pride's very airy and he has a whole percussion vibe that he does instead of just playing like a jazz drummer. He has a bunch of sounds and things going on. So I like that. Yeah, that was a fun album for me. Yeah, yeah I, I like the approach. Like when I first uh, checked out your um, YouTube recently after we just were connecting on uh, chat, uh, you know, I was a little stunned by it. I didn't know what you were into and uh, free jazz is uh, very free, right? Yeah, but but as I'm allowing it to grow on me, I'm like, and I, I of course I've encountered it over the years in my jazz education and stuff, but I had forgotten about it, and uh, it's really a, uh, like you said, it's admirable to me in in like that something from nothing approach. Like we're gonna go in, we're gonna create something. It takes vision. It takes a, uh, I would guess, degree degree of courage. Or you know vulnerability and uh, yeah. faith faith that something's gonna happen you know <laughs> faith, faith based music <laughs> yeah right this is a, this is a real faith faith based music yeah. uh, well you know what it is for me is is like you know you come in you practice on your own there's no pre preconceived idea at all as far as where you're gonna go but I do practice a certain amount of technique and so when I get there it's just an all open book type of mentality. Like anything goes, anything can happen at any point in time. Um, as long as you can physically play it on your instrument. Um, so that's, that's, that's the whole approach. I mean, sometimes I do sometimes think, okay, you know, I want to, if I'm working on a new technique, I want to bring this to the recording. Sometimes I might just do 10% of what I think I might want. Sometimes I might do more. Sometimes I might do nothing. Um, mm -hmm. and I just accept what I'm playing at the time, you know, it's so mm -hmm. funny. The one time I'm doing a podcast, my cat's like making all sorts of noise back there, but whatever. That's it's Marshmallow. That's Marshmallow. What's Marshall? that? Marshall? Marshall is in? Mar Marshmallow. Oh, Marshmallow. Oh, white. aptly so named. Yeah. My kids call her Marshmallow. So. Um, I, have, I have a song that one of my biggest big hits is uh, Marching Marshmallows. It's a video for it. It's like a heavy metal it's like a kid's Metallica song type of thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sounds like fun. That's fun. Uh, yeah, so I'm wondering, when you do your free jazz, and this conversation is very free, I, I'm not uh, going by the question so much. Um, when you're in that atmosphere and you're like, I guess the unofficial or the official band leader since you're, you're saying, hey, this is going to be my name on it, and uh, even though you're not bringing material per se, right? Uh, how, do you like 
I know I've been a band leader a lot in the past and, uh, you know, I give like sort of nods to the drummer or whatever and a lot of visuals. Do you find yourself doing that or you just kind of allow the room to? Not at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I actually go out of my way to say to people, a lot of those albums are the first time sometimes I've been played with people ever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have the gallery and I organize and I get the players and I'm doing the recording myself. All of those albums, um, you know, from what well, since COVID started, I recorded, I believe it's 22 albums and I record them all myself. So it is my scene that I'm setting up. But I tell people, I'm like, listen, I know I organize this whole thing, but it's not really like it's my project. It's our project. Play whatever the hell you want. It's, you know, it's whatever you want to do. Um, and people mm -hmm. love that and they, yeah. they're like okay great because a lot of these guys I play with are like studio musicians and you know they want people tell them man you got to play this way and I'm like no 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 I don't want that I want you to be yourself and two, for two reasons because that's how I am as a person I think the music you should be yourself but I know that the music's going to be better when they mm -hmm. play exactly what they want see I have no preconceived idea of what I want um, so for me, I want to be influenced. I want you to play something that, or some whoever I'm playing with that I never heard before. Cause I want to be like, yeah, man, that mm -hmm. was cool. And I want to be influenced. Um, I'm constantly looking for players that, that influence me. Like I don't play with players that don't make me play different. I want to play with players that push me in a new direction or there's some middle ground somewhere, you know, you know, mm -hmm. I always wanted to be new i always wanted to be fresh and and open to go anywhere i mean there's certain things with certain bands of course like you kind of you know after you do play with certain players for a while you do know kind of like where they might go energy wise you know like some guys are just open free jazz players i'm thinking like from drummer's perspective some are just funkier players you know some are more straight ahead players you know mm -hmm. so um but the players that i hire are usually um, the players that um, they do everything then. they play jazz funk rock free latin and then it goes anywhere mm -hmm. and it, it's a lot of fun so that's I, that's what I like I, it's, it's like it's entertainment for me you know mm -hmm. when I'm playing I'm like I just want to be influenced and and so what I do is is like I'll record the album right and then I save after every song because I've lost tracks before where, like my pro tools just freaks out and just doesn't save anything. So I save every track. And then as soon as we're done, I, I save it onto an, another, I say, I save it directly to my computer, then I save it to a hard drive. And then maybe if I have time, I'll listen to it. And then I won't listen to it all until I mix and master. And sometimes I might not be able to mix and master for like a month and I don't want to listen to it mm -hmm. because I want to have fresh ears when mm -hmm. I hear the record, you know? Um, sure. You know, cause I've listened too much do like sucky speakers, then it's like, you know, it's just, it's just not new to me. So I want to get like a fresh perspective. So then I go in, I get a mix, I give it to the band. I'm like, Hey man, what do you like? What do you want fixed? And, and then pretty much mix it, mix and master, make a few edits and that's it. Um, hmm. So it's real, it's a real quick and easy way to make albums. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, um, but yeah, with the players, you know, it's all about like me searching out players that will push me to be uh, or to go in a new direction. Yeah, I like um, what stands out about what you said is you said, I, I, I want to be influenced. Yeah. I've never heard anyone say that before in terms of like how they approach. And you're speaking as a player, but also kind of as a composer or I don't know how else to like essentially a composer, right? This you're yeah. the one who's putting your name on it and saying this is my album. So you're saying this is how I compose. Do whatever right. the heck you want to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's <laughs> that's the cool part. Because there's so many times, I mean, like all the time, I'm just like, wow, man, I wouldn't have thought of that or I wouldn't have played that way if I wasn't in the room with these certain people. And I know that you know and that's that's kind of like my rush you know of being like wow you know with these players i'll play a certain way with other players i'll play a totally different way um so and that's that's the great thing 
about it for me. You know, um, you know, like the, I develop relationships with certain players because I know they play a certain way. And so we'll go into a certain direction and then we'll develop more of what we both kind of feel. Uh, for example, there's a drummer called Pete O'Brien. I, I record, he's a drum, uh, drummer lives, um, you know, north of the city with me up here. And um, we did, I think, 11 albums together. And uh, wow. it's great, man, because he can lay down like, the nastiest funk groove, do some jazz stuff, free it up. And then the way he hits the snare, like pops really, really hard. And I love that heavy groove. Um, so I can kind of play anything and he'll go with me and push me of where I want to go. So, wow. you know, um, it's it seems boring to me, man, to like, to be like, yeah, I want you to play this and that. Unless I have written tunes and I'm like, okay, you know, this is a jazz tune, this is a Latin tune, this is a ballad. And then when I do have tunes, that's pretty much what I just say. I say, mm -hmm. hey man, you know, like uh, out of the 38 albums I released, I think about nine or 10 have composed music on it, mm -hmm. something like that. And then, mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll say, this is the feel. And then we'll like play, you know, maybe have a rehearsal or something. And then we just go into the studio and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. so. Wow. Uh, so do you have like free jazz um, inspirations? Like uh, is Sun Ra free jazz? I can't think of any names of mm. free jazz players. Yeah, Sun Ra, Ornette Coleman, um, a lot of those guys, all those dudes, you know, Eric Dolphy. Um, they, play, you know, they play tunes too, of course, but um, a lot of those, you know, Coltrane's free stuff. Um, mm. You know, when I, and when I say, you know, when people use the word free jazz too, like I say it to people, I say I play improvised music. Um, it doesn't have to be like like jazz in the sense that it's swinging. It could just be improvised music. Yeah, right. Um, so mm -hmm. um, that's kind of like what I'm thinking. Hold on one second. So I, she's getting, I mean, we can edit this part out. <laughs> she's just gonna she's just gonna sit and meow for like an hour and get my attention. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so, you know, when I listen to the free guys, the free jazz musicians from like the 60s and 70s and on, um, I kind of heavily influenced by that. And also, um, you know, the cool thing is after like, like the 90s, you started getting this, like the 80s too and 70s, you started, you know, you start getting this fusion mix, you know, so my, my style of free jazz now, a lot of times, is, isn't is just um, playing like like a 16th note feel, which I see a lot of guys doing now, like in New York and things like that. They're playing like, like if the tempo's here, like constantly, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes. And I, I'm not so much into that. I'm more into like, well, let's have a beat and go free. You know, like let's make it funky, but I could free on top. So there'll be like a funky groove and then I can be free against the groove, but it's mm -hmm. still, in the pocket you know so the free to me can be free against the beat or just open free or somewhere in between so mm -hmm. um what i'm experimenting now is with um just playing over the bar line playing over the one of the measure um and really kind of just pushing the rhythmic vocabulary like that's really what most of my practicing now is push pushing the rhythmic vocabulary as much as possible um, so in my head, I have this concept that I'm practicing and I know other players have done it, but I like to organize things in my brain because it helps me just practice. So I call it odd meter groove rotation. So with this odd meter groove rotation technique, what I'll do is I'll practice in three. I'll throw four in there, even though it's not an odd meter, but I do three, four, five, six, seven, you know, up to 11, and then maybe take like you know, like five, eight, nine, eight, seven, eight, 13, eight, or whatever. And I'll just play them. Every measure is a new, um, a new meter. So it cycles. So what happens is to me, the coolest part is, is continual spontaneity, spontaneity, spont spontaneity, I can't even say it right. Sp <laughs> spontaneous um, evolution of ideas. You know, like if somebody writes a jazz tune, right? And say they've ripped like a really awesome solo. Well, that's great. But if it's a tune that's already written, then you're not 100% improvising, right? It's a tune and then the solo's improvised. 
Mm -hmm. It might feel different each time, but if it's a free jazz thing or it's just open improv, you're constantly improvising. So what I wanted to do is take that idea and take these different grooves and constantly rotate these grooves where you kind of, the, the general listener, unless I'm playing in the pocket tight with bass and drums, they really don't hear it per se. It probably just sounds random to people, but there is kind of like a method there of rotating that groove. So if it's in like three, like one, two, three, or say, say it's in seven, I'll be like, I might, here, I'll do it right now. I'll give an example, I'll sing some rhythm. So if I'm in three, it might be like, that might be like I went through three, four, and five. And then I could just keep cycling. And I did kind of do like this sucky scat, <laughs> non-melodic <laughs> thing there. But rhythmically in my head, I'm, I'm hearing guitar. Um, and then I'll rotate it. So when I'm playing, it's those ideas are flowing through my head. And then if I'm playing with you know a drummer bass player then it will um, change up even more, hmm. you know, because I'm being influenced. So so you're doing it, but uh, I mean, that's complicated stuff. So you're not saying to the drummer, let's, right, because you're not practicing anything. So no, the let, drummer might not know that, right? Let me give you an example. I have, let me see something, hold on. Mm -hmm. If, um, can you hear this on there? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I mean, I don't really, when I talk to drummers, they're like, yeah, Brian, whatever, just play. Don't, don't tell me. But sometimes I like to talk about the music like we're doing because it's just interesting conversation. But here, I'll give an example. Um, so if the tempo's here, one, two, three, let's see. Uh, So right there, I went from three to four to five to six to seven. So each measure changed. But I like that that funky, I like, you know, I, I, I grew up listening to funk. But I like kind of mixing it up, you know, mm -hmm. because it's like a smorgasbord of ideas. So mm -hmm. here, I'll do it again. So one, two, three. seven and now it's more you know of a groove thing than soloing so if i'm soloing i can be like um something like that so when i'm playing over the one it's like And then bring it back to the one. So the groove is always there. So I'm like, say this is the beat. So I'm kind of like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if that makes any sense, you know? Yeah, it's, it's wacky. Like uh, to hear it, yeah, it, it does sound random, but I could, but there's something consistent about it, which is your style and, and your method, you know? Yeah. Um, and I don't always, and I don't always play like that either. You know, for the improv albums, I do. You know, like I did a gig at a, the other night at some nice restaurant. I played beboppy jazz, like straight ahead. So, for example, is like if I'm playing like a blues, and it goes, uh, Really inside, right? But if I take that same blues and I go, I'll start off in and I'll play with it. Feel the difference? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's hard, the one gets lost in the second one, but you kind of feel that it's yeah. going to so, come around. 
and and if I'm playing with the drums, the bass player is going. You really feel it, you know. Mm -hmm. Some players will keep the groove, and some players will just go with me, but keep the time. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on who I'm playing with and what I want for that evening. You know, if I'm playing like I don't really play a lot of restaurant gigs. Like I haven't played one in years, except for the other night because somebody asked me. So I, I use it as like a tool to practice because the more I can play straight ahead jazz, the more I can play the wackier stuff better because I understand where the beat is and the groove is. Mm -hmm. You know, so like traditional jazz, maybe a lot of eighth notes. So if I hit that, that blues thing again, You know, but do, but do, but then that's what people used to listen to. But after a while, you know, I don't want to play that. I might want to go. Back to it. And then. You know, you play that stuff like at a cocktail gig. <laughs> It might kick you out, you know? Right. <laughs> Want to hear a funny story, man? So I was doing this jazz gig with a bass player named Danny Zanker in Manhattan at an Indian restaurant on like 50th Street or something. And so the guys come up to me. He's like, I'm going to pay you less money. Da, 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 da. And I was like, no, man, we agreed on the money, right? So he's like, then I don't want you to come back, but I want you to finish the gig. So I was like, okay. So we knew we were getting fired. So... <laughs> So there's this lady eating soup like right by us, you know. So instead of playing eighth note jazz, I started doing my crazy jazz. And I'm going like. And the lady's trying to eat her soup and she can't get it in her mouth because she feels like she's going to spill the soup on herself. So, you know, we're laughing and the lady looks up in a real kind of like sarcastic but nice way. She's like, that's interesting music. <laughs> you know, because she was expecting the. It's easier to eat soup too. So anyway, it's just a silly story, but it messes people up, you know? Yeah. When they, they're like, they hear it, but you know, the music, like when I'm doing the wackier stuff, um, hopefully that was loud enough on the recording. It's, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a lot of fun, man, because it's like, for me, it feels like uncharted territory. Yeah, it, me too. I, I like, I appreciate your, uh, your approach because yeah, things get boring, right? And what you're doing is, uh, it's, I don't know if edgy is the right word, but it, it has edges to it, right? It's, it's a little bit yeah. harsh sometimes. It so, is. So that, it could definitely wake you up and uh, <laughs> make it hard to <laughs> relax and eat your soup. Yeah. You know? Actually, my funny story of your, your music, last night I was preparing the interview or two nights ago, and I guess it was last night, and... Uh, I had your music on, I guess it was loud enough to hear upstairs. And it was one of the more uh, rough cuts. <laughs> and uh, my wife which called down, I don't remember which album, but uh, it was, you know, a lot of that edgy stuff, kick, kick, kick out, like, you know, and the whole band was kind of just doing random, very loud stuff. And uh, my wife calls down and says, uh, John, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> But that's that's pretty uh you know i don't know it's pretty energetic or she used some word like please lower that because <laughs> it was right. it was late you know but yeah. uh um i understood what she was saying but I, I also was beginning to understand why you dig it so much you know because of that yeah. it's not heavy metal but it has almost like at some moments that like harshness yeah. of yeah. heavy metal I mean, I, it's funny that you, you said that, that use that analogy like heavy metal, because sometimes, you know, that album actually uh, not so standard. You know, the goal of it was just to take standards and kind of play them like in almost like a heavy metal way. Like, uh, what was that Stevie Wonder tune? The uh, Higher Ground? Higher Ground. Yeah, that was the one. Higher Ground, you know, that was like a heavy metal tone. I was playing actually with an octave pedal. So it sounded mm -hmm. really heavy. And then, um, yeah, you know, so I grew up as a metalhead. So I like that screaming kind of like guitar sound, you know. But mm -hmm. I like playing over jazz changes and I also like just improvising with no changes. So that's kind of, mm -hmm. and I like blues and I like that rock. So I like combining it all in 
at times, you know, not for everything. Um, but, you know, so it's always about, for me, um, raw expression, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what, that's what I'm in it for. So if I don't have it, I don't, I don't want to play it. You know? <laughs> that's just what I'm about, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll tell you a funny story, man. Mm -hmm. When I first started playing guitar, I was taking guitar lessons on Long Island, taking some lessons with a teacher and, you know, like back in the day, it was like a lot of the metal heads studied classical music. And then, so I was taking lessons with a guitar player and he's like, well, let's put on this performance and you can play this classical piece. I was like, okay. And I did it and I hated it, man. I walked off the stage and I was like, and I love classical music. I love listening to it and stuff. And um, I walked off the stage. I was like, I'm never doing that again, man. I mean, I sucked when I played it. I didn't play it well. I just wasn't connected to the music and I made a bunch of mistakes. Um, but I just felt like I'm not the read the paper type of read the sheet <laughs> type of guy. Oh, like I just doesn't excite me, man. Like I just want to improvise. Like I, I, but I'll read jazz tunes and then I improvise them, but I don't want to um, play like Bach pieces my whole life on guitar. You know, it's just, they're beautiful. Like I actually enjoy letting other people play them so I can just listen to it. Um, mm -hmm. My heart is just so much into the improvisation, but having that experience of playing in front of people and not really being so happy and really kind of sucking on the performance, I was like, you know, I didn't feel connected. So ever since then, I'm always about searching for being connected within myself, like, you know, from, from me to my instrument. Mm -hmm. and having that connection is important you know so. yeah wow, that's Found. cool I, I had um somewhat similar story you know when i was studying classical guitar in broken college um so i was 17 when i entered broken college and then i started taking guitar lessons that freshman year and my teacher uh told me uh again like it wasn't Lars, another guy he said, you have a lot of potential, you know, you could be a really solid classical guitar player. And, you know, I was flattered, I guess, but I didn't like it, man. You know, I'm like, there's just no power there for me. I loved a great classical guitar player to listen to. It was great, but I felt they could only go so far. And then like class, uh, guitar ensemble ha definitely had more potential, but it's still the dynamic range was so low for me because I came from listening right. to Metallica and Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue. Right. And, uh, and bombastic um, classical music, Beethoven and, you know, Holst and stuff. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was like, no, I, you know, I just felt I want to learn as much as I can with classical. And I took it like similar to you. It would put me to sleep by just reading the notes. But I said, you know, I do want to learn something. So I'm a composer. So that's how I wrote the season of studies. I'm like, right. let me tr try to do this PIMA, 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 which is an arpeggio fingering for guitar. Let me get this pattern down, but I don't want to just practice, uh, what was it, um, Villa Lobos. I want right. to write my own piece. And uh, that's, I wrote four pieces about the seasons that are all just arpeggio studies, you know, mm -hmm. but they're also kind of, have like a melodic thing interwoven into it right yeah man and they were beautiful pieces you know i remember hearing them um and Thanks. that was super cool you I know I mean, I, actually what you were doing with the seasons and you know writing the different songs for the seasons was what trails was kind of like that album trails we were talking about earlier mm -hmm. um because it was, it was called trails because it was like what does it feel like to walk and hike in trails up in the Hudson Valley to live north of the city. And it's very organic and very spring-like, very fall-like, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Um, so when we recorded that album, um, it was in my art gallery and I work as a landscape photographer. So I think we did have a conversation before. I was like, you know, man, let's try and make it like as a, um, not nature sounding as possible. And I was in my gallery with all my photos around. So it was kind of fun. I was like, yeah, man, you can pick a picture and just look at the picture and play. <laughs> that was kind of the approach, but. Cool. Yeah, maybe that was why I was drawn to that that album. Yeah. And, and that, I, I don't know, I will go back and listen to it more because uh, I did like Appalachian Trail, I think was the name of it. Is that a tune? One of the tunes? Yeah, on? yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So let me see if I can jump to some questions here. Uh, it doesn't matter whether we stick to it or not because we're going many interesting directions. But uh, let's say what what um, inspired you to take music seriously and pursue it as a public presence? Like you're putting your albums out there, you know, and you're saying, hey, hey I'm Brian Kasten. Uh, this is what I do. If you dig it, great. If not, I'm going to keep on doing it anyway, you know. <laughs> that that's it <laughs> <laughs> excuse me um yeah i just love playing man and i love the frame of mind i love the energy i love the focus um <clears throat> excuse me i love getting together players and just exploring new avenues to play mm -hmm. um you know i just always wanted to have i promised myself as a young kid that you know i wouldn't work some sucky job my whole life just for money you know mm -hmm. i thought music was the coolest thing so i'm, I'm still trying to do it <laughs> you know i'm doing it I'm, I'm putting out the albums and you know i mean you know i have um i'm not really known or anything and this and that i mean maybe in some small jazz circles or something like that i joke around with my friends i say oh my claim to no fame is i have 38 albums out you know <laughs> um but <laughs> You know, there's two things that are important. One, the main thing, well, one thing's really important is the music, man, is, is putting out the music, recording the music, documenting music, you know, and then the music business, you know, so to put yourself out there is really the music business. Even if you're playing in some local place, you still have to get the gig, you still have to get the players, you still have to get paid to pay the players and things like that. Um, so that part of it, I actually hate, man. I hate, I hate that part of it. I do mm -hmm. it because I want to play. But everything else I love, like I love composing. I love, you know, I have written tunes too, you know, and I, my free jazz and, but I love just um, bringing it to the people. You know, the other night I was playing this cool trio, man. It was with Nick Gianni on sax. I'll send you the YouTube link later. Um, and, uh, and then this dr drummer, Eric Eagle on, um, you know, and then we were playing this improvised stuff in Pete's Candy Store in Brooklyn. And the way that place is set up is you have, it, it's almost like playing in like a, like a subway train. <laughs> it's, it looks like a subway and it sounds awesome in there. And then the bar is separate. So we start playing some heavy funk and laying down the groove and everything. And then people start coming in and they're digging it. And I'm kind of like, you know, talking to the band after I was like, you know, playing improvised music is the funniest thing because people won't a lot of times be so into it or go buy the albums and this and that. But when they hear it live, they're into it and they like it, you know? So, so that's a good thing. And I, I do love playing for people, you know? Um, but the thing that's like really most important for me is, is like, because the scene is so small for improvised music, um, I think, don't quote me exactly on this, but I think last year or two years ago, jazz albums that were sold were like, 2.5% of the marketplace, <laughs> you know, of mm -hmm. all music sold and the free jazz is like less than 1%. So that's what I'm dealing with is less than 1% of the people that actually um, listen to music will listen to this kind of jazz. Um, so, you know, you go into it with a, th a thick skin. Like I understand this is what it is. There's a small audience. And at the end of the day, I, I just don't care. man. Like mm -hmm. I just want to play it. Um, through the years, I learned to record my own music. Um, you know, there was some, there was some um, bumps and bruises along the way, for sure, like learning how to record and making some mistakes. And I feel now more confident in doing it because I've done it a bunch, you know, different instruments and things like that. So now I feel like, uh, like, you know, once you get, I'm a lifer, man. And I've always felt like that. Like, this is just what I do. I'll put out, I have, I have another album ready to cut release. And um it's just a matter of like uh, just getting the CD cover together and, and putting it out. But at the end of the day, it's, it's about your creativity. It's about the music and it's about the documentation. Like I'm really into documenting what I do. Cause to me, it's like a painting because it's improvised music mostly right now, what I'm doing. Um, it's like a painting. It's like my wife's a painter. She'll go into her, her studio and paint and she'll come out with a beautiful painting. And it's like, bam, that's what it is. And so, with the music it's like well let's just document the day that we played and let's let's put that out you know um 
you know, just, you know, on a side note, and I, I think about this a lot lately. So it's like, like I'm gigging a lot now. I'm playing it in the city. I've got some stuff going on in Boston and, and Connecticut and things like that. And so every time I play the music and I think about the music and I finish the gig, I always feel great, man. I always feel great. And even like the next day, I'm like feeling good. Every time I think, you know, and then when you think about the music business of it, mm-hmm. it's such a downer. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. so it's like, I just want to stay in that positive space, but because there's limited audience for this style of music, um, you know, you just got to be cool with it and be like, Hey, you know what? Um, this is what I love to do. And that's fine. <laughs> you know? and it's, a, it's just like what I am. Man. Like mm-hmm. what I want it's a, it's a beautiful space to be in. I think. Yeah. No, you're following your bliss and, and there's no, out to me about that you know from seeing your attitude and your output <laughs> um, yeah yeah man uh it's funny because for me my evolution is you know we're all unique my evolution has been different um i don't like to perform anymore and it, it's been a while i keep trying you know because it's like this kind of like uh not pavlov's dog but this like instinct to go and perform and I would say since like 2014 or something, when I kind of started to do gigs again, every time I go and did it, I almost always let finish the gig with like kind of a bad feeling. (laughs) Yeah. Even if it's just me. And I don't know, like uh, to me, I mean, it's, it's great to know that I clearly, if you're still going out and doing gigs, you're not feeling like I was feeling Um, it. And, and, and usually they're by myself and it's, I'm not feeling bad because by myself, but it's like, I don't know, like, uh, I hate to use the word prostitute, but I almost feel like I'm like selling my body yeah. and my soul to, yeah. to a certain extent, yeah. you know? And you, I'm like, you know yeah. You know what it might be, man? Just, sorry, I'm going to cut you off. Man. You know, it, it, it might be, you just need to tap into who you are more like, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm just, just, I don't know. I'm just guessing, but I know that's. I think that's totally it. And who I am more at this time period is is not that is not really a musician. It's part of my identity, but it's just not the focus of my my bliss. You know, right? What I've been getting into is a lot of writing. I, I, wrote, I wrote a book and uh, published in last December, which I'm happy about. But already that. The second it was done, I didn't even want to think about it. And that's how, how I am usually with finished products. I want to move on to the next creative thing. S- similar to yourself, I'm not, a, not a lover of the business, whether it be s- selling my, my uh, books or art or, or, or yeah. music. I, I, I do my part, like I have the YouTube channel and uh, I put myself out there. I'm on Spotify and all that too. But uh, I'd rather be creating. So like now just writing my autobiography is much more interesting to me and in terms of like that creating something from nothing one thing i recently got into uh not i mean i've I've dabbled in it over the years but like this spring just like this april i just put my foot down say i'm gonna do it is woodwork and i had i don't know if you i imagine you've played around with wood being from upstate but like i bought i went to down to the hardware store on the corner and bought a saw Mm-hmm. for 20 bucks and uh because i had saw rusty old saws but i'm like i want a good one and i got uh horses you know saw horses last last right. year in preparation and i've since uh built a bunch of things from the scrap wood that's in my mom's garage and my garage and i like i, I just was working on a, building a bookshelf today to fit in a specific space in my basement and i'm almost done and it's it's rough but it it's a bookshelf, you know, and that, that like has me kind of like the way you're talking about your experience of uh, playing free jazz. It, it's like that is brings me a lot of fulfillment and I'm just in my backyard. I'm putting on music. I'm using cassette tape. I have a cassette player back there, putting on cassette tapes and burning some incense and just like, you know, getting into the zone and, and making, using all the scraps that I have around the house I don't like, I don't like to like look at a project and see what do I need and like go buy the ingredients or right. the, the, the material. 
Now let's see, what do I have? And then right. what can I build? I'll, I'll go online, do research to, you know, get ideas, but then ultimately I have to scrap it all because I'm not willing to go buy things. So I just use my imagination and whatever limited material. And it's all learning experience because eventually if I create enough fun projects, then maybe one day when I actually need something, I could say, oh, maybe I could actually do it. I think I actually have skills now, you know? Yeah. Well, it's kind of the same thing as, as, as the music, you know, mm -hmm. like you have a certain amount of skills to build whatever you want to build and you get in the zone and you do it. Right. It feels mm -hmm. good to focus right on stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And I could also, and I'm, I'm getting into gardening more. I want to do a lot of vegetables this year. So building, doing woodwork and gardening go together because, you know, mm -hmm. you might need to built something for the garden so yeah it, it's just this ongoing adventure and you're a lifer i'm a lifer uh, in terms of being creative outputter and uh you know and music too i'm not going to stop i keep on putting out albums and, and singles but a lot of it at this point is just the uh, archival stuff that i just hate to have sitting on my you know sitting on a digital shelf somewhere if it's been recorded and hasn't been released, you know, just right. put it out there. Like you said, documentation. I, I love that concept. I mean, I'm like an archivist. I imagine you are too, to a certain degree. And, uh, you know, for the sake of humanity, really. And for the sake of, of course, our children, we want to leave a record of what we did. Wow. <laughs> she sees the green light from the Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, she's really cute, so I just let it go, you know. Just, oh, yeah, no, I'm sure that, that'll get, we'll get a lot more views with, with her. <laughs> cute cats. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know, she comes up all the time and, you know, we got our thing. She likes to cuddle with me. So mm -hmm. if, I, if I deny her her cuddle, she'll get crabby. And, yeah, yeah. Anyway, as, no as you were politely saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I think there's something to being a, uh, a lifer and just like somehow whether we're making money at it be to whatever like imagined level that we're supposed to from what from what we were like brainwashed to believe growing up whatever i mean if it helps us to be less miserable aka actually kind of content and happy people by pursuing our art i think that's a great thing yeah i think i think that's where it's at you know um you know, I, I live, I, I think like this, like, like one day, like, uh, you know, we're all gonna, we're all gonna die, right? So I want to be on, when it's not my time, I want to look back and be like, hey, I did everything I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. That's it. And, and if playing music is, 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 is it, then you just make it happen, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so can you tell us a little bit how um, photography fits into your into, into who you are in the world? Yeah, so I work as a digital photographer, actually a digital landscape photographer. So I go around the country or and soon the world, not once COVID like totally chills out. And, um, and I take photos of beautiful landscapes. I go to the state parks and national parks or really anywhere I can find a beautiful landscape. Um, so my wife and I have a gallery in, in Greenwood Lake, New York. Um, it's called, I mean, we, we actually kind of shut it down, but we still have it, but we're um, using it as a demo space um, for upcoming auctions. Um, so we're associated with an auction house called um, um, Collector Fine Art Auctions. Uh, the website cfaauctions.com. So I take photos um, I also work with another painter who um, paints on top of my photos. So I'll print my photos on canvas and then he'll paint on top and then they go into auctions. Um, so this auction uh, currently coming up next week, uh, it's from April 23rd to the April 30th is the closing day. Um, it's on a website called Invaluable where people can, can bid and, and, and purchase it. But what I'm doing is um, going around to different countries, uh, um, different states and taking uh, as many different beautiful landscape shots as I, as, I, as I can. I just came back last week from Utah, man. It was great. 
I went to Arches National Park. I went to Canyonlands National Park. I went to Goblin State Park, which is incredible. I went to, uh, what was it, Capitol Reef and Bryce Canyon. And my favorite one was Goblin State Park. It's <laughs> awesome. And there's like, we were talking about hoodoos the other day. So the mm -hmm. hoodoos are these, you know, um, funky shapes that were sitting at the bottom of the ocean. So when the, when the water all dried out, um, they left these awesome sculptures of, of earth there. So, um, yeah. So kind of like was, pillars, right? Like, these, like, yeah, pillars, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I did was, um, you know, I just, I get up as before sunrise, I go out and I take as many shots of the sunrise as I can. Um, I like that, you know, photographers like that morning light and that sunset light. And then, you know, during the day I take as much as I can as well. So I travel all over, um, just trying to find interesting spots. Um, so I actually have my, I don't know if you could see it, I have my camera behind me there. It's hard to see from the, this view, mm -hmm. but yeah. So I go out and I, you know, I'm always by myself. I got a bunch of food with me. I got a big backpack and uh, I just go out and explore nature kind of like an improvised solo. Like I never know what I'm going to take a photo of. Mm -hmm. I just go out there and, and uh, look for interesting things to photograph. And uh, the process is uh, it's fun. It's a hard, you know, I do a lot of hiking as well. And I was, I, was I think I was, may have been telling you the other day. So I wanted to go to the top of Goblin State Park and you have to climb these hoodoos. And so I, I came across it in the middle of the day and I was like, oh, this is great. I love this spot. I'm going to come back for sunset. So I came back like several hours later and I hiked down in the dark and I got a headlamp on and stuff. But when you're hiking through hoodoos, they start to look the same after a while. And there wasn't mm -hmm. like, it wasn't like so much like a trail with like markers and stuff. So I was like, oh, I'm going to come back in the morning, you know, and then hike up and then um, before sunrise. And um, so I'm hiking up and I'm like cranking. I got 40 pounds of gear in my back and all by myself I'm in the dark. And I'm like, I tried like three, four times to get up to where I needed to be. And I couldn't make it in time. I saw the sun coming up and I'm just like, oh, man, I'm not going to make it. I was like, why don't I, I'll just stay down below and so I hiked back down and the hoodoos are like, they almost look like castles, man, out in, out in Goblin State Park. So there's big walls of hoodoos. So I was like, I'm just going to wait for the sun to come up. And as soon as the sun, like say this is the top of the mountain, as soon as the sun creeps over, I want to catch those rays of light mm -hmm. that just glow on the earth. And so, yeah, I just waited like another 20 minutes in the cold and sat there and waited and waited. Mm -hmm. And it was like perfect, man. It was like 20 seconds of awesome light. And I'm just snapping my camera so um, and wow. taking the shots. So when I shoot, I shoot, um, here, should I shoot, um, I'll take it down. I shoot this Sony camera. It's really cool, man. It's, uh, it's a mirrorless camera. So usually a camera back in the day, the light would come into the camera, hit a mm -hmm. sensor, and then, excuse me, would go in, hit a mirror, and then the mirror would reflect it to a sensor. So with this camera here, there's no, um, it's mirrorless. There's no mirror. So mm -hmm. it goes right to the sensor. Um, and it takes really great shots. So when I shoot with this camera, I shoot, I use, um, it takes three different shots. It, it could take regular light, like what you see with your eye. It can take a darker shot or a lighter shot. Um, and you can do more. You can do like, I think up to nine shots, like darker or lighter and regular light. And then when I come home, I compress them all. And then you, once you put them together, it gives me the best of say three shots. So, which is really good. So you can kind of play with the light that way. And mm -hmm. uh, so you have more control. So sometimes I'll shoot directly into the sun, which isn't, you know, ideal, but I can crank the knobs down to make the camera bring in less light so mm -hmm. it doesn't over um it doesn't mess up the exposure of the shot so wow. yeah and i come home and i can process it and then i see what i have you know mm. and then uh i print them up i print them up on like uh sometimes i frame the work sometimes i don't i i, I print them up between what they call acrylic glass which is like it's really probably just high powered quality plastic and it's compressed between the back and the front of the glass, like a, almost like a sandwich. And it looks really clean. Hmm. So, wow. so, yeah. I've seen some of your uh, photos on your Instagram. 
and uh, some of them yeah, really stunning, like, you know, unearthly almost. Yeah. Like, really, uh, I guess that's kind of, maybe you're going for that, I don't know. But um, yeah, really just like gorgeous, yeah, gorgeous stuff. Oh, thanks for checking them out. Yeah, so, um, you know, I really love the Midwest, to me, the Southwest vibe and the Cali vibe. Um, so I just discovered this really cool area of Utah, it's in over by Goblin State Park. Um, and in Hanksville, New York, there's some areas over there that look like Mars, man. Like if you've seen photos from the Mars rover of the rock formations and the colors of the stones, and then you go over to Death Valley, it's very similar. Like, like, like the, it's, it's, it's like clay-like and it's, you know, it's, it's red, it's green, it's blue, it's purple. Um, this is Hanksville, so like, Hanksville, Utah. Hanksville, Utah. Yeah, it's kind of like a half hour outside of Goblin State Park, or even mm -hmm. Goblin State Park. You can go into Goblin State Park, and then you can go like five miles down the road, and there's um, slot canyons in there where you can kind of walk through. But before you even get to the slot canyons, it's like an amazing landscape. It's like this, you know, like in New York, you have these mountains, right, and it's covered with trees, so of course it's green there. It's like orange, red, yellow, green. It's kind of, it's mind blowing, man, the, the landscape yeah. up there. So I, I love it there. I love New York too. Uh, you know, the Southwest blows my mind. You know, I grew up on Long Island where everything's flat and boring. So when I go out there, mm -hmm. it's like amazing to see everything. Um, so yeah, I, I try and document as many of those colors as I, as I can in the structures and the light. Um, so I go out, <coughs> I go out for like a week at a time. Um, I get, always get like an early flight and then so I can catch a sunrise, sunset somewhere. And mm -hmm. I get up in the morning and then I'm just hitting it all day for like five days after that. Wow. Um, and so I've been, to, um, I've been to Utah, you know, I've been to those parks I mentioned earlier, I've been to Death Valley, to Yosemite, to Sequoia, to Joshua Tree, um, to uh, Red Rock Canyon in Vegas, um, New Mexico. Um, so I basically just fly out there and uh, rent a car and just figure it out. <laughs> it's kind of like a solo, man. Like I have no preconceived idea, <laughs> you know, of what I'm doing. I just show up at the parks, I get a map and I, I drive around and look for like the coolest places to take photos. Right. So are you, are, you, are you camping or something or are you getting hotel or Airbnb or something? Uh, yeah, well, most of the time, sometimes I'll crash in the car, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's like once the sun goes down, I might as well just go crash in a hotel. Yeah. So I usually just find a hotel um, somewhere around the park. I mean, the fortunate thing about going to like a national park or something, there's always hotels outside of the park. Mm -hmm. It actually can be pretty touristy at times. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, that's what I'll do. And then, um, and then I'm excited to see what I have. But you said the other thing before, like kind of like outer worldly type of shots, mm -hmm. like Marge's type shots. Those are some of my favorite shots to take. Um, I'll go out there and I look for like weird stuff because that's, <laughs> that's what I like to do, you know? And it's all about the cool thing about being a photographer is it's all about, you know, what's in your, what do you see through that lens? You know, the lens mm -hmm. is powerful because it's about, giving a, a, a point of view or perspective um, right. same thing with the music like a, there's a perspective there um so and the great thing about photography too is like you know you can go to a spot that's famous that other people have um been to and take a totally different shot mm -hmm. you know because nature is always changing right so so with that idea and then just trying to be creative with the the camera about you know photography for me outdoor photography and landscape photography is about controlling the light you know, you don't have too much, you don't want to be too dark. Um, so you get the right light and the, and the right composition and um, try and just be creative with the craft, you know, and try mm -hmm. and find cool stuff. Yeah, wow. Yeah, it, it's fun. I could definitely see how that's a, a complementary uh, part of your your work in the world or, you know, your um, contributing, your way of contributing right because like uh we mentioned in uh, our conversation the other day that um landscape photography is a little bit more 
palatable to most per- people than free jazz, right? It's, it's right. something people can just like intuitively relate to, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the fortunate thing is, is that people, <laughs> just being brutally honest, they tend to dig my photography more than my free jazz, for mm-hmm. sure. You know, because and there's more of a need for it because people want to put something on their wall. They don't need to listen to an hour of like odd meter groove rotation going from three to four to seven to eleven to seven eight. You know, so I, this cat hair is like shoot, like all oh, might make me itchy, man. Sorry. Um, anyway, um, uh, yeah. So people tend to dig it more. So that's why I'm getting into auctions now and 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 you know selling that way because there's more of a, um, more interest in it, you know, and, it, and it's fine. You know, like a friend said to me, he's like, you know, how come you take these shots of these places that people like, but you don't really play pop music? I was like, well, the difference is, is I really like going to these beautiful places that people want to go to. I just want to mm-hmm. take photos of the places. So there's more in common with what I want to do and what people want to see. The music mm-hmm. is different like I don't want to like I like some pop music and I'll play it if I like it but a lot of it I'm just not into so I don't want it in my brain you know Mm -hmm. because you know if you take a photo it could just be momentary but to learn a song it's like you got to learn it you got to memorize it you got to hear it and I you know I want my brain to kind of be pure to what I want it to be Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, whether whatever that means but you know what you know, I want to be in the state of mind I want to be in. But um, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm really happy with the photography. Uh, I'm psyched. Like when I finish an album, I love going out and, 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 and taking some shots, you know, I like to balance it out. You know, I think mm-hmm. that there's a relationship between, you know, the nature and, and the music because the same concept, something from nothing, you know, um, and... Uh, what was the name? What was it called? Uh, when the new musicians that see the colors in their brain? Oh, synesthesia. Synesthesia. Thank you. So, yeah, you know, I definitely have that. So when I'm playing, I see colors. So if I'm listening to music, the sounds are colors to me. So when I go out to um, the Southwest to take photos, um, I see the colors as far as physical things in front of me, not just in my brain. And then my compositions... I think are related to music and vice versa. And I think that the, the music is related to the landscapes as well. You know, uh, I think mm-hmm. it's just the way my brain works. Um, and I always yeah. feel like a sense of peace, you know, in the nature. And it's also, you know, the physical activity of hiking too is, is great. So even if you don't go, go out and get like an awesome shot every day, it still feels good to be out there hiking. Yeah, yeah communing with the uh with the land yeah and most of the time i go out i mean i could take a thousand shots and like one shot's good and the rest are like eh whatever well how do you how do you go what's that process like you you come back you unload the camera onto the computer or something and back it up and then you start looking through them i mean you you yeah need some space first thing i do is well, I go, and then every time when I'm leaving, like on the plane, I always come back to New York. I always feel a little bit bittersweet. Like, I'm super happy and grateful I was able to go, but I feel like I saw so little. Mm-hmm. I saw like less than, less than 1% of what that national park or state park offered because it's so vast and huge out there. Um, but when I, the first thing I do is I come home is I back it up to another hard drive. So I save it. So I have it in two places. Mm-hmm. Um, like this Utah trip, I've been so busy doing other stuff and we have this upcoming auction. I just, I didn't even want to look at the photos yet. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's a little different for me. Like with the music, I don't want to listen to it right away because I want to mix and master it. And I don't want it to get um, like burnt out in my brain. Like I don't want to get sick of hearing about it. Mm-hmm. For photography, I can look at it right away mm-hmm. because it's not as, it's not such a long process. Like the music could be two hours worth of music and then to like analyze it is a lot of energy and time to be like, ah, you know, what do I want to keep? The music is just like, it's either good or not. Like you could just see it right away. Um, But sometimes it's just, it's really based on more of like, uh, at this point, a financial need. Like 
in the sense of like, I know I have an auction coming up and I know that I have to get a certain amount of other work done. Like the work that's already processed and printed, I have to get online, it has deadlines and things like that. Um, so I just wait because even if I had a hundred cool photos, I still can't do anything with them until like I finished this auction. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's that business aspect of it, you know, uh, just trying to get it all together time-wise. Mm -hmm. But as far as photography though, you know, like I'll do these big open landscapes, you know, I got a bunch of shots on Instagram people check out, but in New York state, I like doing more of the abstract stuff. Um, a lot of rocks with water, um, a lot of macro photography, like in the, you know, I love the winter where there's ice on the branches and things like that, because you mm -hmm. can really kind of like zoom in and make these, um, take these small like pieces of ice on branches and make them, make them something uh, unique because all the light, the lines and the ice and the way the light hits the ice is always different um, mm -hmm. than anything else, you know? It's kind of like a snowflake, you know, each snowflake is different. Um, so it's a mixture of these big, large landscapes and, and then the more abstract stuff. Um, like there's a, there's a place upstate New York called, um, um, what the hell's the name of this cave? Um, I, don't know, I can't remember right now, but anyway, it's this awesome cave upstate that has minerals from the rocks, create these awesome kind of like purple, green, some blue colors up there. And I take photos of them and I like it, man. I'll stand in the cave for like four hours. <laughs> and I, I'm like, it, there's a waterfall that comes through. I think there might be a shot on the website actually of the cave. Um, so the waterfall comes through and I have these big water boots on and I'm standing there and it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like 30 degrees, man. And I'm standing there and all the water is not frozen. So I'm there for hours and I'm having a great time just being in this dank ass cave, <laughs> <laughs> taking photos, you know, of different perspectives because there's a hole on the top of the cave. And so the mm. light changes. Okay. So, you know, it's just kind of interesting. So like sometimes I go into the cave and I, I have this three shots that I've actually printed up. Um, you can go into the cave like 830 in the morning and the whole cave is covered with frost and white. And then like three hours later, half of it's gone. So you get a total different photo because it's starting to melt, mm -hmm. you know? So it looks really, really awesome to see the diversity between, you know, what a few degrees will do over a few hours time wow. as well. Um, but it's the same thing, you know, like as far as people like the big landscapes, they don't want to see a lot of times abstract stuff, of abstract images of caves, but mm -hmm. I don't care. I just, that's what I love to do. So I do it. <laughs> You know, so, um, so, you know, it's always a balance between um, what the artist wants to do and then how does the artist survive? <laughs> you know, when, when, yeah, totally. One thing I uh, always remind myself of is uh, Vincent Van Gogh, who so many people would readily claim as super great painter. Um, I believe you could, I, I, I wrote a, the music to a, a musical about him. I did two musicals, children musicals, and one was about Vincent Van Gogh. And so I learned about him. And apparently he only sold, I think, one painting in his lifetime or something like that. I don't know if you know. You know what he sold it for? What? Pack of cigarettes. Oh, man. That's what I heard. I thought it was a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> you know, it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart to think a guy like that would never have had the the satisfaction of selling what later became, you know, millions of dollars or whatever the heck they sell for today. But um, yeah, so apparently he wasn't a happy guy, you know, if you study him, didn't have, wasn't too, he was, must have been, had a tough life, but, uh, but he created from his heart because he couldn't do anything else, right? It's from what it seemed like, he tried to teach that didn't feel right. right. And, he, so, so he was kind of like living off in part from his brother's kindness, you know, type of thing. Uh, or, yeah, it was, it was a rough lifestyle. But, uh, um, you know, if, if, if someone of his stature only sold one painting, we shouldn't, oh, I'm going to say shouldn't, but it's not so surprising if us as artists living today can't make a killing doing what we love either. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's at a point of 
you know, because the industry changed so much. Like when we were kids growing up in the 80s, like I graduated high school in 1990, right? So I just turned 50. You know, you could still put out records back then. And if, you know, they were good records, people would buy records and you can make some money. man. And um, now you can't make money yet, as much money because of Spotify. Was it like 0.400% of a penny? <laughs> you know that song by Pharrell? Pharrell? Uh, I'm happy da, da, da. Mm-hmm. I think I think it was him or maybe I'm wrong but someone don't call me on it but he had like 40 million views or hits on it or listens and he had like they wrote him a check for like 2,500 bucks mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah it was like this biggest song you know um, mm-hmm. anyway it's just what it is now so you know when you put out albums and stuff it, it's basically like an expensive business card mm-hmm. yeah. you know <laughs> it's what it is so but, you know, the thing is, is like with the art and whether it's art or music, whatever you do, I think the bottom line is, is if you want to do it bad enough, you'll figure out a way to do it, you know, and mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's what it is. That's the bottom line. Um, because, you know, the richness that we get from being artists and doing what we do can't be quantified as with the money. No. You know, it's, it's, no. about, it's about the art. But at the same time, we want to make money, right? We, you know, we want to have people coming to your shows and things like that. Um, so I think there just has to be a balance as far as how do you do it? Like I actually, you know, I was a music teacher for 14 years. I was teaching public school. I was teaching high school. I had a 50 uh, piece guitar ensemble. I had a percussion ensemble. Um, so that was cool. I, you know, the cool thing. Um, and I, I think it was interesting to to have that job because it allowed me to do whatever else I wanted Mm. and develop what I wanted to develop. So I think that like, as artists, you have to make the hard choice. Like, what do you want to do? Like, do you just want to just play music for money and, and, and not like it? Or me, I mean, if you like doing that, then that's great. But if you don't, and you just want to take more of a creative route, then, you know, I think you got to have a thicker skin and just kind of like go for it. And sometimes it's better just to make money a different way. So when your mm-hmm. music is special and unique to you, because, um, you know, you're just doing what you want to do, you yeah. know, like when I was coming up, I actually, it was around grad school time and I was playing with some pop check. It was like for MTV rock the vote mm-hmm. you know, at Rutgers university. So there's this big stage and all. And, uh, I try to get into the music and I, I just couldn't get into it. I didn't like the singer, you know, it was just like, oh man. And, you know, and then I, I just was like, you know what? I quit. I was like, I'm not doing this, <laughs> you know, because it just wasn't spiritually fulfilling for me. So, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Charles Ives. Do you remember? I, yeah. I remember learning about him in uh, Brooklyn College. And he, he was a, for those who don't know, he's a American composer in the late 1800s or something like that, early 1900s. And he made his money as a, an insurance salesman and he would be taking these, these trips from New York to Boston or whatever, something in the Northeast, these long train rides every day to work. Mm. And he would just sit and he would compose his music all in his head. It was yeah. weird music. It, it was not, uh, you know, it, it was not, uh, it's, it's not Beethoven or Mozart. It's not like readily enjoyable, but if you give it a listen with an open mind, it, it's pretty fascinating. Um, and he had never had any intention of not composing, but he knew that he couldn't do it for any sort of, he had to make a living. So for him, you know, he had this balance of being a composer of this, this 20th century or whatever Mm -hmm. era he was, uh, I think it was 20th century classical music that Mm -hmm. was kind of grading on the year sometimes and being an insurance salesman. And that worked for him, you know, and he's regarded in some circles anyway, as like this great composer. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, the bottom line is just how, how you get it out. So if he's sitting on the train and going to work and he can, if he can compose, that's great. Yeah. Why not? You know, everyone has, has their outlet that they need to um, figure out how to tap into what they want to do. You know, um, you know, what's interesting is, it's like, for me is, 
you know, like when you do a certain amount of albums, I think, oh, you know, um, I want to get to this certain point. And now whatever point I'm at now is doesn't matter anymore because it's a matter of, well, what's next? <laughs> That's mm -hmm. always my mentality. Like, what's that? I finished a project. It's like, what's next? Like, I might want to like, you know, go hiking or take some photos after. But then it's like, you know, you come back, you know, like, well, what else am I going to work on? So it's always this, it's always this, um, hold on one second. My, uh, it's got to let my cat out. Otherwise she's going to like start meowing like crazy. Um, it's, uh, it's always this flow of trying to be creative, you know, mm. no matter what, you know, yeah. so like, what, what's the next project? And that's why I like booking these gigs because then I, I get the players that will again influence me, you know, to play differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I like really um, rhythmic drummers and bass players that push the envelope, you know, so I can figure out something new. Um, you know, and but you know, getting back to the photography thing, um, you know, what I do do to develop the photography is, you know, I will, you know, after taking like whatever number, just make it up my head, maybe ten thousand photos. You know, you start to figure, all right, well, what what is what is worthwhile, what's worth my time, and what's not worth my time of of creating. So now, after doing all those photos, um, I feel like I'm more efficient when I go out to like the national parks and things like that. Like I just know that the photo might be cool, but it might, it might not be one that I really really like. So I don't want to I don't want to bother taking it. Mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but there was this really cool moment. Like I was at Bryce Canyon last week and um, I actually like going to the national parks, man, because sometimes they get really busy, but sometimes when it's not so busy, you know, you can actually talk to people. So when the sun's coming down, you know, everyone comes out with their cell phones, taking shots, but everybody is in the frame of mind of wanting to see something beautiful. So it's nice, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the total opposite of being like on the subway Monday morning in Manhattan or everyone's <laughs> going to work and miserable. You know? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so, so you're out there looking out at um, this beautiful landscape of Bryce Canyon. So we're there at the sunset and um, everybody's in a joyous mood and you could see the sun coming down and all of a sudden like these two cloud masses just start to form and come together. And it looked like evil, man. <laughs> like beautiful people it was like light and dark and it was great and i had my camera set up and i'm snapping the. i must have took it taken like 200 shots mm -hmm. it over, like it was over a half hour time period like that you could see the clouds you felt the wind going this way and the clouds are moving slowly moving and then combining um but it was a cool thing because it wasn't really just about me taking the photo it was about hanging out with people there and everyone kind of being like looking at it together so even though photography is kind of like um a loner thing in a way mm -hmm. that for me it is because i always go out by myself sometimes there's cool moments with people that you see it together and yeah. i don't like this cool bonding thing you know it's like yeah. a frame of mind of people that are like yeah this is great you know yeah i'm sure that's a unique highlight that uh many other paths don't offer right that you're in this beautiful space and you happen to be with other people who are seeking beauty and if you're in an office in Manhattan or anywhere in the world, you may not uh, have that opportunity. Yeah, right. Um, so Brian, do you have a spiritual philosophy that guides and forms what you do and how you live? Just some like a motto or I don't know, maybe a practice or anything in particular? Spiritual, well, when you say spiritual to me, that kind of could be like kind of almost religious ideals you mean like too if if that if that's what you have but if not yeah like uh what like i mean it sounds to me you're guided by some sort of bigger picture greater good thing uh i'm not sure you said meditation so i don't know like any sort of yeah like you know like a to very typical one be like never give up or like uh yeah you know. well I I think, well, I'm not really religious at this point. You know, I was raised, I was raised Jewish and I was bar mitzvahed and things like that. Um, and I was confirmed in the Judaism religion. But as time went on or is going on, 
and I look at like, you know, take the three major religions, you know, like Judaism, Christianity, and the Muslims and things like that. When I look at like what goes on in the world <laughs> and how different groups treat each other and things like that, mm-hmm. it's a really hard pill for me to swallow to be like, well, you know, you're right and you're wrong and you're wrong and you're <laughs> right. You know, what's 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 mind control, what's not within the religions and things like that. Yeah. So I have a lot of reservations and issues with former religion. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I try to study and look at things objectively. So right now I consider myself more of a spiritual person, but with a Jewish background, I was, I do believe in the 10 commandments, you know, I do believe right and wrong and all that stuff, but how you go about it and, and how you approach it is, like we could be here for another several hours, but you know, with that said, you know, cause to me spiritual, I think could, you know, somewhat be religious based. Um, so I think it's a, comes from like a place of goodness and a place of peace that I try and have within my heart. Like I feel like when I play or when I'm taking photos, see when I'm taking photos, I feel like I'm connected to nature and that's cool, you know, and that's really like that spirit for that. And then when I'm playing the music, it's like, I feel more an emotional expression um, uh, and, and a physical release in a way because you're, you're playing your heart out uh, and tapping into where you are. But you know, you, you said the, the greater good, I, I kind of think is somewhat of that in the sense of, um, you know, I made a choice in my life and my choice was I'm gonna create as much music and art as I can because um, mm-hmm. it's fun for me. And it's expressive for me and it's beautiful for me. And at times it's challenging too, you know, at times it's hard. I'm like, ah, oh. you know, it's like always bumps in the road of trying to make things better and trying to be a better musician, be a better photographer and things like that. Um, so I kind of feel like spiritually, I just want to put out as much as I can. Um, I think, you know, I just, I like really being focused. I like goals. You know, I like doing them, you know, for example, um, so my wife and I had the great idea of opening an art gallery four months before COVID started, (laughs) you know, it was supposed to bring people together and have artists and this and that. So we opened up in like, uh, what was it like October, 2019, no, 2000, yeah, 2019, 2020, everyone's getting smashed with COVID. You know, mm-hmm. so we couldn't open because the state rules and everything. So I decided, okay, well, who knows how long it's going to be in 2020? Maybe it'll be a few months. So I ended up banging out like five albums that year. And then I was thinking, well, that was kind of fun. And I was like, what would be the what would be the uh, the coolest thing ever? So I was, you know, I just turned 50. So I was like, wouldn't it be great to have 30 albums by the time I'm 50? You know, and I was like, yeah, that'd be great. So then I did, I was like, I need 10 more albums. So I did, and then instead of doing 10, I ended up getting like 17 albums just by doing like double albums a day. And then, <laughs> and so now, th- then it was like, hey, just for fun, let me do 40 by 50. And I actually had it booked, but the one of the guitar players couldn't make it. But the number is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. But I do like the idea of focusing of being like, okay, let's do 50 by 50. Cause it kind of keeps me on track. And mm-hmm. I like, I like being busy. I like pushing myself. I like, I'm kind of like a train man. I'm just going forward. And I, I like that feeling. Cause when I play it, it helps me stay in the moment, you know, and always makes me be like, what's, you know, what's next. Um, so as far as a spiritual path, it's about creating as much as I can because not, not from a quantity perspective of like more, but from an improvisational perspective of now. Because mm. now, right? Because now is where now is where the good stuff is. You know, because <laughs> right is, now is yeah. when you're being creative. So if it's a photograph, or if it's music, or if it's, you know improvisation, or from writing it writing a, a tune, now is what's what's cool. Because you can't be in the past and you can't be in the future. It's always now. Mm-hmm. Like we can reminisce about the past and we can think about the future. I do that. But at the end of the day, it's always now. So um, wanting more of now, I think, is a good thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's fun. It's fun. Like I listen back to recordings and I'm like, man, I can't play like that. I have a recording. I have a recording, two recordings from my sons 
one 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 son his name is Thelonious, so the album's called like Thelonious Monk. You know, it's called mm-hmm. Songs for Thelonious. It's a it's 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 a acoustic guitar and nylon string on top. And another one's called Be Cerulean, right? For my other son. I can't compose like that anymore. I mean, I kind of could, if I try, if I really try, I can be in that vein, but I can't solo like that naturally anymore, you mm-hmm. know, because that was 11, 12 years ago, you know? Mm-hmm. So I both wrote them albums. So the idea was to um, to write them both. Well, my fr- the first album, Song for Salonius, I was like, I'm going to write my son a lullaby. I'm not much of a lullaby guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up writing like these jazz, a jazz record. And so I wanted them both to have something special in their life. So I wrote these albums, you know, wrote, actually wrote out the tunes of how they might feel in their life from the egocentric perspective of their father. <laughs> you know, it was about like love. It was about sadness. It was about whatever life can offer, you know, and everything in between. And so they have their albums. Nice. Um, yeah. So that was like a goal. Uh, and then, so I did it for both. Uh, um, but the reason I bring that up is because, um, it's about that that now mentality of living in the present, that improvisers, improvisers mindset where it's okay, you know, it doesn't matter how many albums I have, it doesn't matter how many photos I have, it matters of well, what am I going to create now? You know, <laughs> so that's that's where I'm at, you know, and that's really like my spiritual path as far as like being creative, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I love it. It's very pure in that sense. And of course, like anyone else, you would like to makes some money from your art or be, be known to some degree, but whether or not that happened, that's all secondary, right? Yeah, and, and you know, I am making money. I mean, I'm, I make money doing music. I'm just not a full, t- I'm not making my full living from it. Um, I am making money for my photos though. Like those mm-hmm. auctions, those auctions are super cool. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm in there with some, some pretty big names, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So, so for those people, I'm just going to look on my, uh, for those people who are uh, into the art field, there's uh, some big names there. John Marin, Ram Haju, Edwin Austin Abbey, Milton Avery, Camille Crow, uh, Ch- Child Hassam, Max Lieberman, really big names. Um, Harold Anderson, you know, these people that sell in like um, Christie's and Sotheby's and these giant auction houses and things like that. Mm-hmm. So um, so I'm working with this auction house called Collector Fine Art Auctions. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, selling through them has been great because they allow me, you know, to do more of what I want to do. So I'm going to um, put that, that link, Collector Fine Art, we said CFA. Yeah, it, it's actually cfaauctions.com. CFA plus another a auctions yeah yeah with an s.com auctions.com um so so yeah being accepted into them is great because when i am on the website with all these other um with these great artists you know i'm associated with them i'm selling with them and so it's 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 more of the fine art scene Mm -hmm. instead of just selling photos out of the gallery you know which is Nice. nice you know so what happens is is um when people google you they can see what you sell for and what's the value of things so everything's legitimized because once you're on certain sites like invaluable which is an online auction bidding site Mm -hmm. um it gives you legitimacy and it allows Mm -hmm. people to um take you more seriously as well Mm -hmm. you know so cool Cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm not jumping the gun that you're not making money from that. I'm just kind of, right. uh, I mean, I, I, I'm glad to hear that you are. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I, I guess the, like you're saying, the photos is a financial necessity thing. You may not be doing it nearly to the degree you are if it wasn't to pay the bills in a sense, but uh, the music you definitely would do. No matter what, is that correct? I'm kind of like. Uh, I'm sorry, the phone it, the, this, it broke up the internet. Um, I'm just getting this sense, not that it matters, but I'm wondering like, yeah. to like the music you would do no matter what. Right. Uh, photos, if it wasn't, if there wasn't financial benefit, you may not be doing it nearly as intensely. Um, I would do it as intensely. 
It's yeah. just I would have to find I would have to find another avenue to make money. Right. You know, like if I wasn't making money as much money as I wanted to in the music and not doing the art, I would have to do something else. Um, mm. which is fine, you know. But now I'm making a living being a photographer, uh, my landscape photography. So I'm really stoked about that, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess essentially if I was making money doing something else, I mean, maybe I would do a little bit less because there's only so many hours in the day, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know. I, I I'd figure something out to make it happen. <laughs> So, yeah. so you do, in other words, you do truly love photography. Oh yeah, man. It's like yeah. close to on par with music. It's on par with music. It's like up there, you mm -hmm. know, it's definitely up there. It's just, you know, the, the difference is, is um, photography takes a lot of time to travel. Like I have to go to all these places and I just physically can't be there. You know, I'm home raising two kids, whatever. The music, you know, I pick up my guitar like I did before and play. Because uh, mm -hmm. it's just easy. Right. You know, um, the photography, you know, I do a lot of photography in New York too, but I still have to travel. It's a lot of, you know, photography is time consuming in the sense that it's a lot of traveling and then you have to find the places. Um, that's why I like going out to the, <clears throat> the parks out there because there's so much that's right in front of you. It's beautiful out there, you know, beautiful here too. Um, but it's a different physical you know talk about spirituality it's like it's like a different release in a way like the music is more um emotional in the sense of like talking about that now perspective of how do i feel now to create it when i'm doing it when i'm a photographer it's more like i almost feel like <laughs> it's a funny term like a hunter man you know, mm -hmm. like a hunter looks for stuff and they, they kill it. Not, I, I don't like killing things or animals. It's not my thing. But I do feel like a hunter because I got to hunt down these spots. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to find them, man. You know, and you have to make something beautiful um, from wherever you are. So it's a different emotional uh, role to play, mm -hmm. you know. You know, but if I lived out west, I'd probably take more. I'd take more photos because it'd be easier to get to certain places. Right. You know, uh, it's just, you know, it's just all about time, really, and balance. Um, but it's it's weird because the music is ongoing. Like, if you do a gig, you have to show up. I can, I can send a photo to an auction and then not even be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Like, for me, the performance, you know, obviously, when you're a musician, the performance is being on that stage playing. But when you're, uh, when you're a photographer or an artist the performance is what people see and I don't have mm -hmm. to be there for that. So it's like a different energy. Yeah. I could, um, I could sense that. Yeah. So, but I love them both equally. I mean, they're very different, you know, now I'm kind of like addicted to both, you know, I don't, I can't do one without the other, I think. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You know? Yeah. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. I'll be putting all your, the links that you gave me in the show notes afterwards, including cool. the, fine art thing people want to take a look and learn more about brian so bringing it towards a close uh maybe another question or two sure all right yeah man. So are there any uh setbacks that you'd feel comfortable to share in which music has helped you to pull through in your life if not uh, i'll move on to another question but uh, maybe i don't know like uh uh when my grandmother was dying in the late 90s, I remember I was listening to Alanis Morissette's um, supposed former infatuation junkie album a lot and Billy Joel's Nylon Curtain. And I don't know if that they helped me to pull through, but in the sense that I just felt good when I listened to them, you know, even yeah. though it was a really tough time. Um, I don't know about pull through, but that band Yes with John Anderson, Mm -hmm. you know those guys they like his lyrics are so positive man and <laughs> so warming to me I always feel good you know um listen to those guys you know there's this album by Pat Metheny that I really love uh Missouri Sky it's with Charlie Hayden on bass I, yeah and Pat Metheny and it's real simple uh 
it's just it's just guitar and bass and the songs are like really beautiful and sad sad beautiful in a way some mm -hmm. of them so i really like that when i'm kind of just in like a like a you know like i don't know maybe like a lull state or something mm -hmm. um, i like to listen to a lot of sad beautiful music sure because i think there's a lot of honesty in it mm -hmm. you know um but nothing really huge like for me the music has always been um it's just been an escape from stuff that sucks <laughs> you know <laughs> You know, like when life sucks, it's like, you know, I just want to play, you know, mm. I just want to like, I just want to play. Like, you know, it's funny, like, um, like people who are drug addicts, you know, I, I think they take drugs a lot of times because they want to distract from their sucky life, whether it was abuse or whatever it is, you know, for me, I'm like, oh, let's just play some music, man, because, you, you know, you can kind of just step away from the negativity of the world. And then, and just have some fun and play, mm -hmm. you know, so. So, yeah, I guess in, in that sense, that would be kind of the answer uh, of like, you know, how music has uh, maybe helped you pull through. Maybe it's not a specific like yeah. dark night of the soul, but just in general, whenever you're kind of bogged down by the heaviness of the world, music, you know, makes you feel good. I, I definitely think that there's uh, a psychological aspect to playing. You know, originally we was talking in the beginning, I was talking about like a trance state. You know, there are studies where people have, you know, hooked people up to these neural feedback machines and, and, and tested the, um, the electricity in people's brains, you know, that, that measures the alpha waves in their brains and all these brain waves. And it, people do get into a state of meditation. And I think that's what it is for me. Like I get in it, you know, I'll give an example, like sometimes, you know, I could be playing, man, I'm practicing the home. I'm really into it. And all of a sudden, like I'll get an email or something and I'm like, oh, I got to check this email. So I check the email and then for like, and then something shows up on Facebook, like, you know, and then I look at it and then I'm like, okay, I'll look at my Facebook page, man. It feels like within like three minutes, like my brain just like melted. It was in like this really cool state. And then I'm looking at this dumb social media page and I'm like, why did I bother? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, but I say that, I say that because you really feel the difference when mm -hmm. you're in that state versus just staring at um, a useless screen. Not now it's a worthwhile conversation, <laughs> but you know, like social media, I'm like, I, I feel like my brain is different, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, I think there's, you know, some scientific um, information there that that's cool. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of vague because everybody's different. It's hard, hard to quantify, you know, but there is, a, it definitely like keeps me happier, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The couple of things jumped to mind. Well, the theme of my book, by the way, it's mind, mind your music is the name mm -hmm. of it. And it's basically about uh, the importance of, being very aware of what music we allow into our lives because right. the subtle energies can influence us one way or the other. And uh, then another thing I thought about was um, <clears throat> I keep my phone on airplane mode about 90% of the day, maybe 80 to 90% of the day. And I'm so much happier doing it. I'm, I'm in, in a luxury that I can. I know some people just can't because of work or something, but I feel so much better. Like uh, there, there was a, this one guy who wrote a book called Deep Work. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'd appreciate it. And I think this, the guy who wrote this book, I think he doesn't, I think he has an email, an email address, but he doesn't have any other social media, no profile anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he basically in his book, he explains that like, if like picture a still pond, right? If we get into that, it takes us 15 to 20 minutes at minimum to get deep into what we're, so like as a writer, if I, if I don't have a long time to write it, it's, it kind of stinks, you know, because I really want to get into it. So it takes about 15, 20 minutes to get to that deep 
place of like focus on what we're in our project, whatever we're focused on. And then if you get a ding from your phone or an email, which means that you're connected, like airplane mode is not on, right? That you're allowing dings and notifications into your life. Or it could be the, the you know, it could be the, the doorbell as well. But yeah. um, it takes, it'll get, it pulls you, it's like essentially it pulls you out of the, the water. Like you just submerged in your submarine and you got to take another 15, 20 minutes to get back down there. Or you got to like imagine you throw a rock in a pond and those ripples are going to take as long as they take until they fade away. Right. Which right. sucks. It's terrible, you know, for a creator. For a creative person doing yeah. deep work, being, yeah, being pulled out of that zone is is so painful. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. And and you know what happens too is is like if you're not famous, and and you know you have to do a lot of this work yourself, so you have to post. Like I post all my gigs on Facebook, you know, before, after this and that, and then you know because that's that's what the game is in 2022 yeah. <laughs> it's just what it is you know it's interesting right like when we were kids right i got like 10 years nine years on you whatever. so i graduated in 1990 right i remember man people being like yo man what are you doing this weekend i'm going to check out this band let's go check out this band and it was cool because you went out with your buddies and you checked out music you know and so now you say to someone hey i'm playing so so and so and they say, let me check out your YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> so the difference in culture 30 years later is a big difference because those people won't go check you out because they don't want to leave their house. They just want to see what you sound like or hear what you sound like, you mm -hmm. know? So, so, but I say that because I, I think it's a little bit more challenging now to get people out because they're so used to being on their screens and things like that. Yeah. Um, so, so, so it's kind of like, if you don't sit on social media as a unknown person, um, that doesn't help you either, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? but I yeah, guess, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. you know, so I guess it's kind of like anything, man, it's about balance, you know? Um, so when I feel my brain like melting and, and not being in the zone, um, I just, uh, I just step away from it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, totally agree. Yeah. I have some friends who told me that they they're off Facebook or I've been tempted to get off it, but I never have because I do realize it, it does have a lot of benefits for someone in my position, especially mm -hmm. having friends all over the world and family in other countries. Right. Um, it is convenient for that. I don't really want to eliminate that. Uh, uh, and I don't really get the negative aspect of it too much. Um, so yeah, but I've dwindled, like I don't use Instagram anymore. Um, and I just have basically YouTube and Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, so point being, I found what works for me because you're right. I do have to, as an artist, be present in the world. Otherwise, what am I creating art for? You know, my neighbors, you know, <laughs> but um, yeah. I, and I, I say, you know, that's part of being an artist. And my part of my being an artist is I do want to share with the world and I do want to have a voice and, this wouldn't be possible if I wasn't on Facebook because that's how we connected. Right. So it is, it is uh, certainly valuable, but yeah, I, I definitely benefited from learning, experimenting. I tried LinkedIn. I tried Instagram. I tried all these things and slowly, but surely simplified and found the two that I'm going to work with and just stick with that, you know? Right. Um, so, uh, maybe to bring it into a close, so I actually want to get this video up tonight. Um, can you share up to three inspiring books or films, albums, some, you know, some inspiring things that maybe people could check out if they were interested in being uplifted? Uh, what's a good albums? I mean, I would just say players, man. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, um, I, I think Wayne Krantz is super awesome. You know, he's a guitar player. Um, he's more well known. Like, he did play with Steely Dan for a bit. But his own work, you know, his own music is way deeper and way, you know, is, you know, like, super creative. I think he has his own rhythmic palette and his own um, voice as a composer. So, 
he's got everything, man. He's like a great composer, uh, great improviser, um, um, and just has a unique style, you know. And I mentioned him because he, he you know, he's uh, his band is awesome too, you know, with uh, Tim Lafave on, on bass and um, Keith Carlock on drums. But he plays with a lot of different guys, but. Um, she keeps nagging on. She's like crawling on my back here. Um, who Wayne, else? Wayne Prince. Wayne Prince. Yeah, he's he's awesome, man. Mm-hmm. And um, he played the Fifty Five Bar a bunch, you know, through the years. I don't really know what he's up to now. I haven't really been checking out, but um, so uh, yeah, I mean. I, I mean, there's a lot of players I listen to now, like as far as modern guys, you know, these guys like everybody knows, like, you know, like Schofield, um, you know, Pat Metheny. I love all these guys. I love Scott Henderson. You know, he's got this whole blues thing, too. He's got a great tone. Uh, Mike Stern, Vic Joris, great jazz guitar player, passed away recently, unfortunately. Um, And then more straighter guys, you know, like like Pat Martino, Wes Montgomery, um, George Benson, Charlie Christian um you know as far as guitar players um i love victor wooten man on bass his mm-hmm. whole slap technique with different fingers you know is 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 really unique um but one thing I, I would say you know just what i'm trying to do between guitar and bass is um i like playing that funky free trio stuff and um so i'm kind of trying to play like a heavy groove man because mm-hmm. i want to groove but i also want to be loose as well so uh so i have like three mindsets i have a bass player's mindset guitar player's mindset and a photographer's mindset (laughs) (laughs) as far as you know just just music and stuff but you know so what influences all those three things is um I've, i've listened to so much music um i kind of don't even sometimes i don't even listen to music man Honestly, mm-hmm. sometimes like like lately, I find myself wanting just to be silent in the car and just hear my own music in my own head. Mm-hmm. You know, when I went out west to Utah, you know, it was so beautiful in this new landscape for me. I didn't listen to any music because no. I was just so stimulated by everything around me. You mm-hmm. know, like it's at a point where um, I, it's almost like, you know, it's like they say, like you study this music and then you study jazz or ideas or certain players. And then you forget about it and you forget right. about it. So you don't sound like them, mm-hmm. you know? So uh, not that I can't learn There's more out there. I can learn than I'm ever going to know. It's just, um, I think sometimes it's really important to just sit in your own head and create, or, you know, contrary to what I just said, sometimes if I'm doing like trying to create some really like out there music or whatever okay. in my head, sometimes I'll listen to something like Neil Young or Joni Mitchell like just mm-hmm. really good singer songwriters, but it's so far from what my creative spirit is at a certain time mm-hmm. that it doesn't like affect it. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. like like before recording, as much as I like Wayne Cran, Schofield, and all these guys, I won't listen to them right before because I don't want it in my head. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of weird. Like I don't transcribe their licks now. I used to, you know, I, I I've done it, but I won't. I don't do it now. So. It won't be in my head, but I just want to be in my own presence mm-hmm. because my goal is to kind of start, have, have a vocabulary of my own, yeah. you know, and I think all those guys, man, that are great. And all those guys that I mentioned, they, um, they all have their own thing, you know, and mm-hmm. I'd like to get there. I'd like to get there one day. Sure. Uh, you remind me of, uh, one time I saw this master class with Eddie Van Halen. Uh, it was in his later years. And um, I think the interviewer said like, uh, so what kind of music do you listen to? And assuming he listened to rock music or whatever. And he says, I don't listen to music. Uh, you know, I just get in my car and I like to listen to the, the roar of the engine. Right. You know, that's what he wanted to hear at that point. I mean, you know, he was already older, so. Who right. knows when that practice began, but yeah, I, I can imagine someone like him listening to his guitar sound, you know, it sounded like certainly earlier in his life, he listened to a lot of songs and tunes and learned how to play. Right. But a lot of it was just like 
what was so great about him was these unique sounds he created that no other guitarist can create. Right. And, and how do you get that? You know, so you must, you know, you must pay, pay attention to sounds, you know? I, I might have, I might have seen that same interview because it sounds familiar. And then, you know, they, inter they asked him, they're like, how did you develop your style? And he said, and it makes perfect sense to me. He goes, well, he goes, I wasn't really good at copying other people. He goes, I would mm -hmm. kind of learn, not, don't quote me on this, maybe like half of what they knew. And then he would like kind of make it his own way. And I was like, yeah, I was like, that's what a lot of players do. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they kind of learn parts of things and then they create and embellish it into their own style. So, mm -hmm. but all those players, you know, or, or artists or painters or whatever people do, write movies, whatever. I think it's always the same. It's, it's about tapping into what your story is and what you're about as an artist and, and what do you want to say? You know, and those are the guys that, that, that last, yeah. you know, those are the guys that have longevity, you know, like there's a guitar player I should have mentioned before, Bill Frizzell, who's great. He has his, like this, his own kind of like harmony sound and solo style and composition style and things like that. And, uh, you know, I never met the guy, but I'm sure he probably just, uh, he was like, hey man, let me just go off and kind of like create my own thing purposely, you know, of course, and and then bring it into the jazz world, you know, because I, I haven't heard his chord voicings and things before he played them, mm -hmm. you know, so, right. you know. Cool, man. Yeah, so we could obviously just go on and on and on. So I guess yeah. uh, um, I'm going to wrap it up uh, since I want to get this up there tonight. And thank you for your time. Cool. Thank you for your uh, sharing you know your uh, stories and your insight and very unique perspectives on on music and and yeah it's been a pleasure definitely talking to you uh brian yeah man my pleasure too and you know it's, it's great to re you know reconnect with you and and hang and talk and you know i think mm -hmm. that's awesome and maria says hello by the way oh very cool um, yeah hi to yeah. her she was excited she's like oh you know you talked to john i was like yeah yeah you know, we hung out the other night online for an hour. It was cool, you know, so, yeah, so it's cool. good. It's good. I like actually like, you know, uh, you know, you know, someone for a little bit, a short time in your life, like a two, couple of years, we knew each other in school and then you don't see each other for 10 years or something. It's kind of mm -hmm. nice to catch up and reconnect with people to see where people are, you know? Yeah. So it's good and, to hear all the good things people are doing. Um, all right, cool. All right, dude. Have a great all night. Right, Thanks again. All right. Thanks. Yeah. All right, later.